just as Martin and John and, and others here, uh, Jeff, I've been part of the behavioral OR initiative since the early stages, and I've participated in many of the events. So uh, that gave me the motivation for, for this talk. I started realizing that uh, there is a part of behavioral science research, which is from recent to very recent, and I think it's largely unknown in, uh, in behavioral OR community. So I figured I'd put some a presentation together to introduce you to this kind of literature, and I, and I hope to convince you why it's actually important. Uh, a couple more caveats. I, I'm afraid that this could actually be an annoying talk for, for some of you, because if, if you perceive it the way I intend to deliver it, you have to conclude that you, we should all actually be doing extra work. <laughs> My punch line is that there are, in fact, many interesting catchy deadline, uh, headlines from behavioral science, but we actually have the duty to go a little bit beyond them. And simply, as you can understand, exactly because the statistics in some part of this, uh, in this behavioral science research was actually not done properly. So the headlines, unfortunately, are not really correct, <laughs> or at least they need to be qualified. Or in any case, when we are engaging with this research, either adapting it to our context or redoing it or simply talking about it in a paper or in a pro using it in a project and so on and mm -hmm. so forth, we should be looking deeper. That's, that's basically the point. Um, so I, I cannot avoid uh, presenting a little bit of math, but it's actually very little and I'll try to make it layered so somebody who doesn't exactly understand things in the mathematical way can still understand the concepts, and somebody who's interested and wants to be convinced by something more rigorous, they also can. So I'll try to do a little bit of both of these things. Uh, is there a clicker or? No, no, I just, okay. <laughs> so coming back here. So um, behavioral operations research, in a way, it's sister discipline of behavioral operations management. And in a way, both of them are emulating a little bit the success of behavioral economics, the first behavioral, let's say, of the social and management uh, sciences. And they're using a similar approach, which is to take experiments where the, part the subjects are people and they produce data. And the whole point is to establish a knowledge base about how people behave based on these experiments. So, there are, of course, a lot of work about behavior on the job, but most of it, I would say, or at least a lot of it, is not exactly on the job, is in a lab with a task that's quite general, and it's supposed to give exactly general basic knowledge. And I believe this is mostly the kind of behavioral science that uh, is inputted from the outside to OR. So, let me make that a little more concrete with some examples. The idea is always to, to go to this task where there is a normative model and contrast people's behavior in the lab, as I said, mostly, with the predictions of this normative model. For example, probabilistic reasoning. What do I mean here? This is actually one of those cases where it's much easier to see how it relates to the job, and it, this has been done. So if you consider a clinician, that receives a doctor that receives um, uh, the test of the result of a test for a patient. So let's say that you are a woman and you're getting the results of a mammography, right? For, to see you know, if, if breast cancer is a possibility or not. And let's say that the test comes back positive. So this is actually very close from a standard Bayesian inference task. There was before the probability that this woman has breast cancer, unconditional probability, and now after the result of the test has become known, we're talking about a conditional probability. So we have to update the probability based on some new information. So this is a standard Bayesian inference task. And there is a lot of evidence from behavioral science about how uh, doctors, are able to do this, how patients are able to do this, how everybody understands it, and so on and so forth. The normative model here would be Bayes' rule, 
and we can put people in the lab, we can give them such exercises and tests and see how well they do, okay? Uh, another case would be the decision under risk. Uh, I'm pretty sure this, this you've all seen in the guise or, or another. It's the standard, it's the most basic decision task. So uh, there are options and the different options have different outcomes with associated probabilities. So, for example, you can consider that about uh, project completion. You can think whether this uh, colleague or that colleague has a higher probability of completing this project and what's going to happen if the project is completed well or not and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of research on that as well. And here the normative model would be something like expected utility theory. It could also be subjective expected utility theory and so on and so forth. Um, Another possibility would be strategic interaction, and that's mostly more popular in operations management. So in procurement, at some point it could really be that one of the two sides uh, issues an ultimatum. So your, your supplier could say, okay, <laughs> that's the price, you know, and if you don't want it, I have to move on now, I cannot waste any more time on you. And you have to decide whether you want to pay that price, whether it's a credible threat, and so on and so forth. And here the normative model would be game theory and sometimes there's some um, uh, variations of it. So it's always the same game. There's a normative model, quite well established from mathematics and statistics, and uh, the behavioral researchers are trying to figure out if what their subjects do in the lab matches the predictions of this normative model or not. So, something that I'm not going to do today is to criticize this, nor this normative model. I'm not going to do it not because it's not very important for OR. In fact, it is very, very important. In a way, it's the most important thing because that's often the stumbling block to using mathematical models in practice. What the theory says the practitioner should be doing, it's really very unclear to the practitioner. So, for example, you can see it in all the three normative models that I, that I discussed. So clearly for the expected utility theory, I mean, this is a little bit of a fantasy that anyone could figure out all the outcomes and all the probabilities. And even if they could, certainly many cases, other um, objectives, such as, for example, uh, uh, maximizing the worst case scenario, maximum criteria, is at least as reasonable. It's not clear why we should go with uh, uh, maximizing expected value or utility. For Bayes' rule, even though that has probably stronger appeal, still in practice, if you have many attributes and you're not willing to uh, assume that they are conditionally independent, given the, the value of each product, then it's also very unclear how it could be done. And also for game theory, you, you, you can make similar arguments. But I'm not going to go into depth into all these things. I'm not going to complain that the normative model is the problem. In, in what I tried to tell you here today, remember, I'm trying to tell you something in the hopes of making you look a little bit deeper into behavioral research. It won't be about looking deeper into the normative standard. That's something, but this has been also done a lot, this criticism, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I'm also not going to talk about uh, gathering the data, whether the data is of high quality. This is also well known that sometimes the data is not of very high quality. And this is to <coughs> some extent a little bit unavoidable. For example, there's research on overconfidence of decision makers. And of course we know that sometimes the experiments were designed so that people appear overconfident. There's this standard uh, question, which one of two cities is more north? Rome or New York City. And of course, almost everybody believes that New York City is further north <laughs> in the globe than Rome, but it's actually not true. <laughs> so you see, you can get someone to give you the wrong answer and be confident that they're right by selecting some things that really look correct, but they're wrong. But this is not representative sampling of the questions for establishing overconfidence. And you can also have unrepresentative sampling of your participants, and so on and so forth. And all these criticisms are kind of known as well, and I'm not going to get into them anyway. What, as I promised, I will get into it is how the data was analyzed, which is the proper domain of statistics. Okay, so 
getting a little bit further into that. So as I said, we're talking about data from experiments and we're talking about people's behaviors. And the conclusion tends to be that people so biased or are unreasonable behaviors. So in terms of statistics now, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that in a, in a very broad way. Uh, it won't be really at the level of the most basic statistics you can imagine as running a significance test or something like that that I'm going to criticize, even though this also has been criticized a lot, especially recently with the replicability crisis. It's, you may have heard that, for example, in big data, it's also a common problem that so many hypotheses are tested for significance at once, that even by chance alone you get some significant effects and then there's no correction to account for the fact that you did mostly hypothesis fishing rather than hypothesis testing. But again, I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about more concrete things that mostly have to do with interpretation. You get a finding and uh, somehow based on this finding and some elementary processing of the data, which is what statistics is, you have a conclusion. So it's a... Uh, it's uh, less technical than the usual uh, meaning of statistics, even though the technical application of statistics have also been criticized, as I said. But it's going to be more, more, um, more basic than that, I would say, less technical. So I'm going to do it with examples. And in probabilistic reasoning, there's two things that come up that I thought it would be interesting and useful to bring up. One is overconfidence. That I briefly talked about, but I'm really going to focus on the hot hand fallacy. And then in decision under risk, there's also probably many more than two things that I'm aware of, and I'm going to focus on risk attitude reversals. And finally, in strategic interaction, I'm going to focus on uh, uh, inequity aversion. So all of these things, hot hand fallacy, risk attitude reversals, and inequity aversion, all of those have been used as examples of unreasonable behavior. And I'm going to try to, I'm not going to prove to you that they're reasonable, because we can always debate about that. But I'm going to try to demonstrate to you that the, the thinking about interpreting this data certainly uh, could, could be challenged. So, and as I said, that means that we don't have the license to just read the headlines of behavioral science, no matter how uh, popular it is or how well established it's considered to be. If we want to do a good job, we have to probe a little bit deeper. And if so far I've been a little bit abstract in talking about concepts, from now on it will only be these three uh, concrete examples and we'll go through them quite, uh, quite slowly. So the first is the hot hand fallacy. So that, of course, fits very well with Bill Stock, and this is the great LeBron James, and the idea is those of you who are interested in sports, those of you who have played sports, so on and so forth, almost everybody believes that there's something like the hot hand, you know. If you are uh, shooting well, somehow it looks like this just made it a little more possible that the next shot also is going to be a successful one. Almost everybody believes that and probably they continue to believe it unless they have read behavioral science, <laughs> unless they have read a series of research that started about 30 years ago at Cornell University. And it actually never really went away, ne was never really challenged until very recently. So let's try a little bit to, to define, let's say, the, the problem. You're a basketball player. Let's say that you scored three times in a row. Does that, everything else being equal, make it more likely that you will score again next time? Of course, first of all, let's get rid of, you know, some kind of simple objections. Of course, if it's a game situation, of course, you can imagine that the coach of the opposing team makes sure that this guy is being handled much more carefully. And of course, that could be the reason why they, they actually uh, not able to score in the next attempt and so on and so forth. Somehow you have to keep it equal. So, for example, in the Cornell University study by Tom, Tom Gilovich, 
you can do that a little bit by looking only at the free throws. There actually there's no more pressure. There's nothing that the other team can do. So there are ways of making it a little bit equal. Of course, it's never equal because time has passed and you're more fatigued and so on and so forth. But OK. So this is the question. If it does make it more likely that you will score again, if you were scoring before, then you have a hot hand. If you don't, and as I said, people believe that there is a hot hand, then it's a hot hand fallacy, right? So now what I'm going to say, I'm going to say how recently some researchers challenged the idea of the fallacy. So the progression is until 1985, people believed in the hot hand. From 1985 until 2015, people believed in the hot hand fallacy. And now I think it makes more sense to believe again in the hot hand. So <laughs> let me tell you why. So by the way, as I said, trying to build more rigorous, that's a bit what, what you will have to do. You will have to think. This is a conditional probability, and this is an unconditional probability. Overall, for a player in the context of a game or of a season, they have somehow an estimated probability that they're shooting the target. But it's only estimated, right? It's not the true. The true we can never know. It's just empirical. And this is also, again, an estimate. But now, if we want to see if there's a hot hand, we have to establish that after, given that they have scored three times, that's what this means, on the right side of this, of this symbol, that they will, they will succeed again in the next one. They will score the fourth basket as well. Yeah? So if, if something like that uh, holds, to some kind of according to, the, to, to all of the standards of statistics and take into account measurement errors and noise and blah, 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 somehow we would be happy. Now I'm going to make it a little bit simpler. I'm going to move from basketball to coins. Yeah? So there will be an H again, but it will be heads, <laughs> not hits. So let's say really that you're flipping a coin all the time, and you want to see if the coin has something like a hot hand. So does it make sense to say that if you get three heads in a row, the next head is uh, more likely to be a head. Of course, if it's a fair coin, do you understand? No, and in general, we don't believe that about coins, unless by, by flipping these coins, you learn something about how to flip them to get heads. But that we don't believe either. So uh, there is another th the question, though, is uh, if I'm getting, uh, if I got three heads in a row, what's the correct standard for comparing the probability that I get again ahead, uh, is it 50% or something else? So almost everybody would say it's 50%. So they would say, if uh, you threw the coin, th you flip the coin three times, and you got three heads in a row, again, if you flip it again, and, the and then you get the head about 50%, then there's no hat hand. But if you actually get it, more often, there would be a hot hand. And there could be also a cold hand if you get less than 50%. But here comes actually the, the weird thing. The weird thing is that the 50% is not the correct uh, benchmark. The correct benchmark is actually much smaller. To go back to the basketball player, let's say that the basketball player was really very good. So they were about hitting about 50%. If they hit three times in a row and they hit the basket, then if you wanted to see if they have a hot hand, you shouldn't compare the probability that the fourth shot is in to 50%. You should compare it to less. Now I can see I confused almost all of you. But it is really the case. That's what I'm going to try to demonstrate in the next two slides. Once again, if you hit three times in a row and, and the basket goes in, and you're trying to figure out in the fourth time if the person has a hot hand, you shouldn't say if they have 48% that they do not have a, a hot hand because this is very close to 50%. But the correct number to compare the success with would be about 42%. You see? So the previous research was, com was comparing it to 50%, but they should have been comparing to 42%. And that's why, they, in fact, got the, the wrong quote-unquote conclusions. 
I haven't convinced you about it yet, but do people see, <laughs> do people see what I will try to show in the next two slides? Yes, that would help. You can see it here. Okay, better. Is there a marker here? Yeah, right yeah. Right yeah, yeah. Good. So it's because there's a little bit less detail here. What I'm going to show now in the next two slides, that's one of them. Let me see how I can write it. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> normally, of course, remember this is a good player, he's like flipping coins. So he, overall, his unconditional probability of hitting the basket is 50%. Nevertheless, the correct benchmark for deciding that somebody has a hot hand is not 50%, but it's smaller. So when they did the experiment, they found that the success of these players were about 50%, and then they said, oh, there's no hot hand, but in fact, 50% is larger than 42%, so in fact that's a significant advantage. In fact, not only there's a hot hand, but the hot hand is quite big, <laughs> if you want. That's what I'm going to try to demonstrate here with this thing. So before this goes away again, forget again the player, let's go back to the heads and the tails. So, I flip the coin a hundred times, yes? Yeah. And I record everything that happened, heads and tails. Then, I collect these flips, of the coin for which the preceding three flips were heads. So, you see, this is one, right? Because the previous ones are heads. In fact, this is one too, because the previous three ones are heads as well. Yes? So I put only these flips that come after uh, sequences of heads, streaks, yeah? Okay, and those are in here. And now take one out and random. If I was making maybe a semi-good job at explaining that, you would see what I'm going to say now, what would be enough, is that the probability of this one being a head is 42%. It's not 50. It's 42. Because we have some more knowledge that this, this was done by the experimenter. So moving on. <coughs> it is less than 50% because of the following. So, if the researcher said, so now they, they make a little bit of a, of a play, the researchers who did this. By the way, all of this is explained, I think, very well in an online publication that's called The Conversation, it is UK based, so you can find it. I, I found that they did a great job for this one and the graphic is, is totally due to them. So, they make a little bit of, of a joke, so 42% and they also pick uh, flip 42, they could have picked another number. So, if they say that they pick 42, and you have to consider what's the probability that this is heads or tails, what did you learn? You learned that it's actually more likely that this is a T. Why? Because if it wasn't a T, they could have uh, picked 43, but they didn't. So, in other words, uh, Picking flip 42 is actually more likely in a world, so to say, where, the, where 42 is, uh, is tails. And by Bayesian inference, that also makes it 
more possibly that this is our world. I cannot do anything better. But I can tell you that this is a very sound logic. And because I also have a couple more puzzles like that to present to you, then you know, if, if, if we can come back to it in the discussion. But the conversation has also some more words beyond these things. Nobody disagrees anymore, not even Tom, Thomas Gilovich from Cornell that did the original research, that the correct benchmark wouldn't be 50% but would be 42. So it's a little bit like what I was saying here. If we were flipping coins, we should not test if this is larger than 40% but 42. And it was. In the experiments, actually, the, the, the players shoot much more than 42%. Yeah. So <laughs> this, this is the two researchers who did that work. They're both economists, even though this is a, a statistics thing. But they're most economists. A couple of few things. This is actually yet not published. In economics, it's quite common that even a very good paper is moving around for years before it actually gets accepted and published. And they're trying for the very best journals. And they still haven't been able to get in. But not because the, their argument is not correct, but because economics is just very difficult to publish in. So you can also get the working paper, but I recommend the conversation. So for a very long time, you would hear everywhere, oh, people do all sorts of, uh, you know, they exhibit all sorts of biases in probabilistic reasoning. Overconfidence is one. And another one would be something like the hot hand fallacy. They believe in hot hands while there are no hot hands. As far as I understand right now, we should be living in hot hands again. OK, so let's try something with a decision under risk. I think it's going to be, it's going to be easier to follow. So there's two, two problems. Again, you can imagine that somehow the probabilities come by using some kind of random device, and it could be a coin again. The, here it would be really a fair coin. So I offer you this, uh, this choice, this choice under risk. Either you get 500 pounds for sure, right? Or you're willing actually to risk. And if the coin comes up he heads, let's say, you'll get more. You'll get 1,000. But otherwise, you will not get anything. So. These are kinds of experiments that behavioral scientists run in the lab to find out how people make decisions under risk. This is one choice, and here's another one. They're very similar, but this is a different one. So here, uh, what has happened, the stakes are a little bit smaller. So you would get 50 for sure. You can again get 1,000, but now the probability is much smaller. It's only 5%. And otherwise, you get nothing. So uh, let's say now it's one of you that you really are a participant in this experiment. What would you do? What would you choose here? And what would you choose here? You can think about it for one minute silently. Anyone who thinks that they have a brilliant idea they can say. And <sighs> there's not exactly a wrong and a right answer. For each one of them separately, there isn't. They're majority answers. Nevertheless, the economists believe that there is a wrong answer, an inconsistent answer for picking one of them here and another one here. Right? In other words, if you pick one of them here, you should also pick a specific one here. That's where the mistake, quote unquote, will come in. OK, who goes for this? It's not clear, actually, it's a, an exact majority. OK. <laughs> who goes for this? Yeah, you see, some people are just indifferent. OK, <laughs> so this, this was the majority. So let's say you in the majority would pick this. What about, what about this? Okay. <laughs> 
Well, first of all, I mean, you see that the expected value is always the same, right, in, in all choices, right? So that's the thing. That's why these things are supposed to measure attitude uh, towards risk. On the average, no matter what you do, it will be the same. But, you know, here you're willing to gamble. So if you are only doing it once, you really are gambling because you're hoping that this one time will be a lucky one and you'll get the 1,000. But you may not. So here you would be risk-loving or risk-seeking uh, if you chose this one. And the same here, right? Again, if you, if you chose this one, you're hoping that you'll get lucky if you did it just once. If you did it many times, it doesn't matter. So this or this one? You know, if you, if you were using, if you forgot statistical thinking, if you're just using social intelligence, you must have expected that most people choose that because I told you that this is a device that economists use and other behavioral scientists to argue that people are inconsistent. So here most of you uh, were risk averse and here actually most of you would have been risk loving. Why though? I mean if any, any one of you could reflect why you switch your risk attitude. Right, so this is large enough that you're willing to not take a risk. You'll be happy, you know, with not doing the best you could. You'll be happy with that. So, in other words, the worst case scenario is kind of maximized here to, to a good extent, right? While here, uh, if you look at the two minimum gains somehow, difference is not so much, so you say, okay, fine, you know, I, I can, at least I can hit it big, right? So you would change your risk attitude. So already based on what John said, and a couple of people are nodding, you, it, it's not clear at all why, let's say, I would say first a practical person, but then more generally I would say a, a thinking person. <laughs> it's not clear why they would they would call a result like that unreasonable or biased. But according to the normative standard of expected utility theory, it is. Because there you cannot change your risk attitude. This simply follows. So let's see a little bit what happened. Research basically, so this is the result, right, as I told you. And research typically calls that as unreasonable. And as exactly as Martin said, um, an explanation of this comes really from prospect theory, uh, which eventually is one of the cornerstones of um, behavioral economics. It earned a Nobel Prize in economics for a non-economist, Daniel Kahneman. And you know, if you're an academic and you worry about citations like we do, then you'd be happy to know this has about 50,000 citations. I'm sure if we, if we add the citations of all of us in that room, it's less than half of this. So this was very successful, very popular. And if now you are an OR person and you want to know about behavioral science, this is one of the first things you will see. You will see this graph, which is a probability weighting graph, and is sufficient for explaining the phenomena you saw before. If people are overweighting small probabilities, that's what this says here, this is the, a person's perceived probability, so to say, versus the real probability. If people think, if people act as if a probability of 10% is something like 13%, so to say, if people overweight small probabilities and they underweight large probabilities, so if people act as if a probability of 95% is something like 91%, let's say, then one can show, and this has been done, one can show mathematically, that you will get results like the one I saw before. And this is usually called in behavioral research, again, unreasonable or a bias. But I believe exactly because of the reasoning that John uh, gave, and I saw you nodding, that this is actually not exactly fair, or at least 
let's not put the value judgment on it either way. Let's not say it's reasonable or unreasonable, but at least let's understand that there are other explanations. And here's one, and I'm not going to go through it in much detail, but it pretty much is a more full-fledged uh, expression of, 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 what, of what John said. So if you first look at the minimum gains of your two choices and compare them, and if you find that one is much better, you stop. That's what this says. If you think they're almost the same, you do the same thing about the probabilities of the minimum gains. And again, if there's a big enough difference, you stop. Otherwise, you ask your last question. So I can demonstrate that. For example, exactly with this one. Uh, what are the minimum gains, the 0 and the 500? Now in this box, you know, it's a little bit vague. It says the minimum gain of one gamble, which is 500, is it much larger than the minimum gain of the other, which is zero? So the difference is 500. Is that big enough? Uh, as I said, that I wanted to avoid putting too many formulas. But of course, when this paper was done, the, the researchers, uh, they said exactly what much larger means. And it's 10% of the larger thing you can win. So here, the largest thing you can win is 10 is 1,000. So 10% 10 is uh, 100. So 500 is larger than 100. So that's why you would pick this based on the minimum gains. But something changes if you look at this one. Now, exactly as we were said before, 50 minus 0, the difference between the minimum gains is actually now small. According to the same criterion before, it should be at least 100, but it's smaller. It's only 50. The probabilities of these minimum gains are, this is 100% probability, and this is 95%. It's only 5% probability. And the researchers also said that the difference should be at least 10% for it to count. You can, of course, set these thresholds differently as well. But this is reasonable to say it's 10%. So because of that, you would go to the third reason. And the third reason, it switches now. In fact, what drives your choice is that you're going for the maximum. And the maximum 1,000 is larger than 50. So that's why you go with this one. So what I'm trying to say, economists would say that this is some kind of um, rationalization of someone's choice. You can definitely uh, deconstruct it and reconstruct it. And it somehow doesn't look like you're doing anything erratic or capricious such as changing your uh, risk attitude. Your risk attitude rather ends up changing because you're following a sequence of very simple criteria. That's the idea. So again, this is statistics in the more general uh, sense of the way. There was a phenomenon, this phenomenon. And if you only look at the headlines of behavioral science, you will get, yes, people are inconsistent and they change their risk attitude. And you'll get the feeling they do it just, yeah, just out of boredom or just because they don't know any better. But you can definitely rationalize it. So that's, that's my argument. OK. Uh, and now for my final example, strategic interaction. So this is the so-called ultimatum game. Remember, I talked to you a little bit about procurement. It's a very simple game. Uh, the first part is a little bit weird because there is windfall money. So again, as I said, I'm not criticizing here the quality of the data. This can and has been done. Of course, you could say, where does the money come from? All these experiences are useless. This is not, you could say this, actually. It is a problem that suddenly two people are presented with a 1,000 pounds. And of course, as you can imagine, most of the time, this 1,000 pounds was hypothetical. So that's even worse. But nevertheless, this is where a lot of the behavioral science evidence comes from. What are the rules? The two players, they have distinct roles. One is called the proposer. So he gets to offer, to decide how much he's going to give to the other person and how much he's going to keep for himself. Yeah. And in this case, in this experiment by Werner Gutt and others, which has fewer of the problems I just said. So first of all, it was incentivized. Some of these people at random were chosen so that they would really get the money. They, would, they could get these 1,000 pounds. So that problem was solved. And also, it was done through a newspaper. They had more than 1,000 participants. So it wasn't done with undergraduate students in the lab. 
So this is actually a very good experiment in that sense. So once again, the first guy, the proposer, decides how much to offer, 100, 200, 300, you get the idea up to 900. And the responder decides whether to accept or reject. Um, okay. uh, if he accepts, then what the proposal was made is actually exactly realized. So if, I, if I'm the proposer and I give you 100, then uh, you get 100, I get 900, and we're done. And if it's rejected, then none of us gets anything. We both get zero. So this is some of the standard data. Running a little bit out of time, and I think, first of all, given how many of you came here today, and then how puzzled you look, at least in the first puzzle, I'm going to give a, a premium into allowing you to ask questions very quickly. So I'm going to go through that very quickly. So. Uh, what is the problem here? The problem is that, as you could imagine, people are people. So, first of all, even though you should accept any offer, people didn't do that. This graph here on the left shows um, the probability of acceptance of specific offers. So, if the offer is small, only 100, for example, or 200, this white box here shows the probability that, that the responder accepts it. And it's not 100%, you see. It's actually much less. People are insulted if you give them too little. They know you're going to keep 900 if you offer them 100. And they know that you have some kind of bargaining power, but they still don't like it. They're willing to punish themselves in a way and get zero in order to punish you as well, you see. So uh, you see a little bit like that. You also see that hyper-fair offers are rejected sometimes. And this could seem maybe unreasonable a little bit to people like us in Western societies. But if you go to some other societies in which this was a lot of money, what happened is if you make a hyper, a great offer to someone, then this person believes that probably that means that the next day you'll come and you're going to ask for something. <laughs> so that's why. Uh, and maybe some of it is also left through evolution for us as well. So we also. Ex, uh, um, reject these offers. And in terms of the proposers, even though the proposers could reason that nobody would uh, throw away free money, right? So then they could offer just 100 or 200. The people who offer such small amounts are few. And in fact, uh, eventually people offer uh, much more frequently the the fair uh, offer of 500. Uh, again, it's possible. I run out of time, as I said, I'm going to stop right now. Uh, this is Amos Tversky, and actually had anticipated how this could be rationalized, and we did that. Again, by looking at the simple motives that people can have, we can rationalize this behavior, and we don't have to call it unreasonable. So wrapping it up, statistics in the broad sense. There's more overconfidence. That's a more technical thing. It can be shown that it's regression to the mean. If two variables are linearly related, but the correlation is smaller than one, you expect something like overconfidence. I can talk about that more. There's a nice article which is not covered at all in what I said. So I complained in passing about uh, rationality, about normative standards. I complained about um, the quality of data. And mostly in this uh, talk, I complained about um, statistical analysis and interpretation practices. But Lola Lopez, in a paper that's very little known, also within psychology, has complained about other things that is so well written. Even for that, even if you disagree, I recommend it. The Rhetoric of the Rationality is not a book. It's the name of the article published in a journal called Theory and Psychology. I'm sure if you Google it like that, uh, you'll find it. And there she explains a little bit. Why it has to do a little bit with the motivation of researchers. We, first of all, academics are such that they're happy if, if they can demonstrate somebody else made a stupid mistake. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's some of that. And second, uh, when this research came out and there were all these demonstrations of how our logic falls short, a lot of people uh, capitalized on that and they saw it as a business and selling, as he said, is, is a good business to sell rationality you know, to people 
who think they don't have it. They, they, there was this self-help um, guru in Canada called Deepak Chopra, and he had written a book, many books, many, many books. And I remember at some point I was reading a review that really gets to that point. It says this book is brilliant because it says you are not as sick as you think you are. You are more sick as you think you are, and I can cure you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, read, read, read the piece by Lola Lopez. I wouldn't insist so much if I didn't know that almost nobody reads it, and that's, that's really a pity because it's very good. Okay, so what was that all about? Uh, we are analyzing human data. A lot of the experiments are great, and even if there's a small flaw, there are small flaws in all experiments anyway, they're still very useful. Uh, I wasn't complaining about lab data or anything like that particularly. I was, I was complaining about sometimes too quickly uh, making a conclusion about what, what that tell us, tells us about uh, human nature. And I had three examples. I did my best to explain some of the statistical problems or the interpretation problems. And then, as I said, I, I'm, I was going to be a little bit annoying. I think if we really want to take what's known about behavior or we want to start seriously reflecting about people's behavior and use it in operational research, we simply have to do the extra work and not just believe something just because it's a very popular piece of research or because it has many citations. There is sometimes significant problems with, uh, with, with behavioral uh, research. Thanks very much.